We all think we get aging, don't we? It's just, you know, time passing. Another candle on the cake. Uh -huh. But what if that's, you know, well, what if it's just not the full picture? Or maybe even kind of wrong. What if aging isn't this uh, inevitable ticking clock, but something else, something we could actually influence, maybe even reset? That's a huge shift, and it's really central to the sources we're looking at today. For a long time, the main idea was, well, it's about DNA damage accumulating, mm -hmm. like typos creeping into the book of life. Right, the actual letters A, T, C, G getting messed getting up, broke. broken. Exactly, mutations, breaks, that sort of thing. But what this newer research suggests, and is highlighted in these sources, is that maybe the primary issue isn't the loss of the genetic code itself. That code's actually pretty robust. Okay, so if not the code, then what? It seems to be more about a loss of epigenetic information. Epigenetic. Okay, we share that word a lot now. What does that actually mean in relation to the DNA, and why is losing that so important? So think of it this way. The sources use a really good analogy. Your DNA, your genes, that's like the digital music stored on a CD. All the potential songs, all the data, it's there. Got it. The raw information. Right. But the epigenome, that's more like the CD player's instructions, or maybe even scratches on the surface of the CD. It's the system that tells the player which tracks to play, when, how loudly. It's what makes a liver cell act like a liver cell and a brain cell act like a brain cell. Even though they have the same exact music, the same DNA. Precisely. The epigenome controls gene expression, turning genes on or off. Uh, okay. So that's where the scratch to CD idea comes in. The music, the DNA is basically fine. Largely, yes. But the system reading it, the epigenome gets scratched up or disorganized over time. Exactly. Things happen, environmental factors, just metabolism, cell division, and the epigenetic marks, these little chemical tags like methylation on the DNA. They get put in the wrong places or removed from the right ones. Gets noisy. So the cell starts reading the wrong genes uh. or forgets how to read important ones. Yeah, it loses its original instructions. It gets confused about its identity and function. And that cellular confusion, that loss of youthful function, is what we perceive as aging. And you can actually measure this disorganization, this ep epigenetic noise. Oh, absolutely. This has been a major breakthrough. Since about 2013, scientists figured out that these epigenetic changes, especially DNA methylation, happen in predictable patterns as we age. And predictable enough to measure. Yes, predictable enough to create what they call a biological clock. You can take a sample, blood, saliva, whatever, analyze those methylation patterns, and get an estimate of your cell's functional age. So not just how many birthdays you've had, but how old your body is acting on a cellular level. Exactly. It's a number that often tracks better with health span, with your risk of age-related issues, than just your chronological age. Wow. Okay, that really changes things. Because if aging is this loss of information, uh -huh. does that mean maybe possibly you could restore it, find the original information again? That is the huge, really exciting question. It's the core of this information theory of aging. Mm -hmm. If the DNA is the music and it's still okay, right. and the problem is the scratched CD, the epigenome, yeah. Yeah. maybe there's a way to polish the CD. Or maybe there's a backup copy of the original youthful epigenetic state stored somewhere that cells could access to reset themselves. It opens the door to the idea that aging isn't strictly a one-way street. And this framework, this loss of epigenetic information, does it help explain all those other things we hear about aging, like uh, telomere shortening or zombie cells? It provides a potential underlying cause, yeah. Those hallmarks of aging, senescent cells accumulating, mitochondria not working well, telomere issues, they could all be downstream effects of the epigenome getting scrambled. How so? Well, if the cell can't read its operating manual correctly, it's going to make mistakes. It might fail to maintain its telomeres, its mitochondria might become inefficient, or it might get so confused it just shuts down functional processes and becomes senescent, one of those inflammatory zombie cells. Okay, so the big picture is aging seems to be largely about losing the right instructions, the epigenetic information. That's the emerging paradigm. So for you listening, the mission here is to take this understanding from the sources and figure out, okay, what can we actually do about it? Now, what are the practical steps from simple things to maybe more advanced stuff down the line? Right. And the good news is a lot starts with things that are quite accessible lifestyle choices. A big theme in the sources is this idea of um, challenging your body in controlled ways. Controlled ways? Like stress? Isn't stress bad? Well, chronic relentless stress is bad, yes. But short, manageable bursts of stress can actually be beneficial. It's a concept called hormesis. Hormesis. Okay. Like exercise stress. Exactly. Exercise is a perfect example. Yeah. Or fasting. 
or even bursts of heat or cold. These things signal to your cells, hey, times are a bit tough, better activate defenses, repair things, become more resilient. You're sort of tricking your body into thinking it needs to up its game. In a way, yes, you're activating ancient survival circuits. And these circuits involve key longevity genes or pathways that the sources mention repeatedly. Three big ones are MTOR. MTOR, right, senses nutrients. Yeah, especially protein amino acids. Then there's AMPK, which senses low energy levels, like when you're fasting or exercising. Okay, AMPK, low energy sensor. And then the sirtuins. These are a family of enzymes, kind of like guardians of the epigenome, involved in DNA repair and stress response. They need a molecule called NAD to work which tends to decline with age. So hormesis activates AMPK and sirtuins and maybe dials down MTOR? Generally, yes. That seems to be a pro-longevity state. And how do we do that with lifestyle? You mentioned fasting and exercise. Eating less often is a big one. Doesn't have to be extreme fasting. Even just shrinking your eating window each day. Time-restricted eating gives your body break, lowers MTOR, activates AMPK and sirtuins. Compared to just grazing all day long. Exactly. Constant snacking, especially sugary stuff, keeps MTOR signaling growth and storage, not repair. Exercise, as we said, is huge for AMPK, sirtuins, mitochondrial health, even helping clear out some of those senescent cells. Any other hormetic stressors? Heat and cold exposure seem promising. Saunas? Cold plunges, they trigger beneficial stress responses, can improve metabolism, maybe even build resilient brown fat. And sleep. Where does that fit in? Oh, sleep is absolutely fundamental. Not really hormesis, but crucial for repair. Chronic lack of sleep messes everything up. Metabolism, hormone balance, brain cleanup. You need that downtime. Yeah, and managing the bad kind of stress. Mental stress. Yeah. yeah, chronic psychological stress leading to high cortisol is definitely counterproductive. It undermines all the repair processes. So finding ways to manage that is key. So it's not just eat your veggies, get some exercise. These specific actions, eating window, type of exercise, sleep quality, stress, are levers pulling on these core longevity pathways, influencing the epigenome. That's the connection, yes. And it's powerful. One source mentioned twin studies suggesting something like 80% of your health in later life isn't predetermined by genes. 80%, wow. It's potentially under your control through these lifestyle factors. That gives you a lot of agency. Okay, but how do you know if what you're doing is working? Beyond just feeling good, I mean, can you track this stuff? That brings us to monitoring, right? Yeah, you can't really manage what you don't measure. Flying blind isn't ideal. And while your annual checkup is important, it's just a snapshot. So what tools are there now? We're getting more options. Continuous glucose monitors, CGMs, are becoming more accessible. They show you minute by minute how food, exercise, stress, sleep, affect your blood sugar, a really key metabolic indicator. Instead of just one finger prick at the doctor's office. Right. Then there are advanced blood tests. Nice. Going beyond basic cholesterol, looking at inflammation markers like HSCRP, detailed lipid panels, liver function, kidney function, maybe even specific markers for cardiovascular risk or nutrient levels. And wearables, watches, rings. They're getting better at tracking sleep stages, heart rate variability, HRV, which reflects stress and recovery, activity levels, resting heart rate. They give you trends over time. What about those biological clocks you mentioned? The epigenetic ones, can regular people get those done? They're becoming available commercially, yes. Still mm -hmm. a bit pricey, maybe a few hundred dollars, and the science is still evolving rapidly. Different clocks measure slightly different things. But yes, you can get an estimate of your biological age based on methylation. And the goal is, what, to see that number go down? Or at least slow down its increase relative to your chronological age. Researchers are working on making these tests faster, cheaper, maybe even something you could do regularly from a cheek swab. Imagine having a dashboard for your biological age. That would be motivating. See if your lifestyle changes are actually, you know, moving the needle on aging itself. That's the vision. Track the impact of what you're doing. Okay. Lifestyle, monitoring. What, what about pills? Supplements, drugs? The sources brought up quite a few names. NMN, metformin, resveratrol. Right. This is where things get really exciting, but also where you need to be careful. There's a lot of hype. It helps to think about the strategies these molecules use rather than just a shopping list. Okay, strategies. Like what? Well, one big strategy is supporting those longevity pathways directly. We mentioned sirtuins need NAD, and NAD levels drop with age. So compounds that boost NAD, like NMN or NR, are popular supplements being studied. Trying to replenish the fuel for those protective enzymes? Kind of, yes. Another strategy is mimicking the effects of fasting or calorie restriction. Metformin, the diabetes drug, does this subtly. It slightly stresses mitochondria, which activates AMPK. So it tricks the cell into thinking energy is low. Essentially, yes. 
and it shows health benefits in studies that go beyond just blood sugar control. Rapamycin is another one, a potent MTOR inhibitor that dramatically extends lifespan in lab animals by mimicking nutrient scarcity. Are there things that target sirtuins directly? Resveratrol, the compound from grapes, was famous for that, though how well it works as a supplement in humans is still dated. Spermidine is another interesting one found in many foods, seems to boost autophagy, the cell's cleanup process, and might help maintain the epigenome. Berberine is a plant extract that also activates AMPK, a bit like metformin. Lots of AMPK activators. And what about clearing out those senescent zombie cells we talked about? That's the senolytic strategy finding things that selectively kill off those dysfunctional inflammatory cells. Certain plant compounds like quercetin and physetin are being researched, sometimes combined with drugs like desitinib. Does exercise help with that too? Actually, yes. Exercise has been shown to help clear some senescent cells naturally, mm -hmm. which is another plus for lifestyle. So for all these molecules, NMN, metformin, senolytics, where does the evidence stand for humans and aging? It varies a lot. Metformin has quite a bit of human data though mostly in diabetics or for specific conditions. For many supplements like NMN or resveratrol, the robust human anti-aging data is still pretty limited compared to animal studies or the evidence for lifestyle changes. Senolytics were in clinical trials but aren't standard practice yet. It's an evolving field. So they're all aiming to kind of nudge the system back towards youth, support those pathways, clear out junk. That's the general idea, using chemistry to try and restore or maintain that youthful epigenetic information in cellular function. Okay, which leads us to the really futuristic stuff. The idea of actually reversing aging using technology. Sounds like sci-fi, but the sources hint at it. What's happening on that front? This is where the information theory really gets interesting. If aging is lost epigenetic information, maybe we can restore it directly. The groundbreaking work here involves what are called Yamanaka factors. Ah, the Nobel Prize winning stuff. Turning regular cells back into stem cells. Exactly. Those factors can completely erase a cell's epigenetic identity, making it pluripotent again. Now, you don't want to do that to your whole body that would likely cause chaos, maybe cancer. Right, you need your liver cells to stay liver cells. But the idea emerged. What if you could do a partial reprogramming? Use the subset of these factors, or maybe apply them for a shorter time, just enough to reset the epigenetic clock and restore youthful gene expression patterns without erasing the cell's identity. Just wind back the epigenetic age, not turn it into a totally different cell. Precisely. Polish a CD without erasing the music library structure. And have they done this? In animals, yes. Some really remarkable results. One study mentioned in the sources involved old mice with damaged optic nerves, basically blind. Yeah. They introduced just three reprogramming factors into those nerve cells. And incredibly, the cells rejuvenated. They regrew axons, connections were reestablished, and the mice regained vision. Whoa. They reversed age-related damage and restored function. In that specific context, yes. It wasn't just slowing aging, it was functional reversal in a complex tissue. That's pretty mind-blowing. In mice, though, anything remotely like that in humans yet? It's very, very early days for humans, and we need way more research. But there was one small trial mentioned in your sources that caused a stir. What did they do? They gave a small group of older men a cocktail, including growth hormone, metformin, and another substance called DHEA for a year. They measured their biological age using several epigenetic clocks before and after. And, on average, the clock suggested their biological age had decreased by about two and a half years. Reversed by two and a half years. According to those clocks, yes. Now, huge caveats. Yeah. Tiny study, no placebo control in the usual sense. We don't know about long-term effects or safety or if it translates to actual health span extension. It's but a hint, proof of principle that maybe epigenetic age can be turned back in people. Exactly. It cracked the door open to that possibility. It needs much more rigorous testing, but it was tantalizing. What about other high-tech ideas? Stem cells, mm -hmm. exosomes. S stem cells are our natural repair crews, but they age too, epigenetically. So rejuvenating stem cells themselves, maybe using these reprogramming techniques, is a big focus. Exosomes are tiny packages cells release to communicate. They might be useful for diagnostics or maybe delivering therapeutic molecules, but their direct anti-aging role is still being figured out. So it feels like we're really at this inflection point. This new way of thinking about aging as information loss is opening up everything from basic habits to, well, reprogramming ourselves. It really is. 
The science is moving incredibly fast. The potential seems enormous, but so are the unknowns, especially with the cutting edge stuff. But the foundational things, the lifestyle levers activating those core pathways, those are solid, accessible now and have real evidence behind them. Okay, so let's try and summarize the key takeaways from this deep dive, pulling from all these sources. We've really challenged that old view of aging as just wear and tear or just time. Right. The central idea emerging is that aging, in large part, seems to be a loss of epigenetic information. The instructions get noisy. And because it's an information problem, it's not necessarily a one-way street. It reframes aging as something that could potentially be slowed, maybe stopped, or theoretically even reversed by restoring that information. And we see the range of approaches this understanding points to. Mm. At one end, you have powerful lifestyle stuff, how and when you eat, exercise, sleep, manage stress ways to activate your body's built-in longevity defenses via hormesis and those key pathways like AMPK and sirtuins. Then there's the monitoring piece using tools like CGMs, wearables, better blood tests, and maybe soon accessible biological clocks to actually see what's going on and track progress hmm. to move beyond just guessing. Then we get into the molecular interventions. Hmm trying to boost things like NAD, mimic fasting with drugs like metformin, maybe activate sirtuins or clear senescent cells with senolytics. Lots of research, some things more proven than others, but all trying to chemically support useful function. And finally, the real cutting edge. Technologies like epigenetic reprogramming, showing stunning results in animals like restoring vision, and those first tentative hints in human trials suggesting biological age reversal might even be possible someday. And maybe the most crucial thread running through all of this, especially emphasized in one source, is that stat that maybe 80% of how well you age is actually down to your choices and actions. That's incredibly empowering. It puts a lot of the responsibility, but also the opportunity, right back on you, the listener. Absolutely. Which leaves us with the final thought for you to chew on. If aging really is this loss of information, this potentially resettable process, does that fundamentally change what it means to be old? Does it redefine the limits of human health span? And with these technologies developing so rapidly, how do you personally navigate this? How do you make informed choices for your own health journey today while keeping an eye on what might be just around the corner? 